this is the fourth time I've been here at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, and I found every time I have a flashback. The flashback is to a time that's 38 years ago. I'd been in an office of naval intelligence in the Pentagon, and I'd spent all day with a pair of dividers with a sharp point right squarely where this always happens to me, in the middle of Red Square, and the other side drawing circles. The circles were showing how much of Moscow would be destroyed by a bomb I'd worked on for about six months that we called the SOB. I remember intensely the sense of failure and just general unhappiness when I found that the circles I was drawing didn't include all of Moscow. And I looked around and I a sense of the insanity that anybody at any time could be sitting doing these circles with the idea of promoting under some conditions dropping a hydrogen bomb now, then it was a huge fission bomb, and instantly wiping everything out. It was, the word insanity just keeps coming over and over and over again. August 6th, 1945. This day was the culmination of four years' work for the team of nuclear scientists working at Los Alamos on the Manhattan Project. Many of them had considerable doubts at what they had been doing, and ever since, scientists have been debating the morality of this work. But turning complex theory into ever more powerful weapons was an exciting challenge, and after the war, Los Alamos continued to attract some of the United States' most able scientists to the rapidly growing nuclear weapons program. I've had nothing but a sense of total revulsion of what nuclear weapons do when they explode. But there's a irresistible seduction to what they are. You start peeling away and looking inside and doing this on paper and seeing the astronomical numbers, the pressures that are higher than the pressure in the interior of the sun, the temperatures that are higher than the temperature in the middle of the sun, speeds that are close to the speed of light. It's a whole universe of excitement tied up in the very middle, the last millimeter, in the middle of the bomb, when it's being imploded and goes critical and then it's suddenly expands with a force that is literally astronomical. There is a technical seduction because this is wonderful physics, this is wonderful mathematics, this is wonderful computer science, this is wonderful chemistry. This is a challenging engineering field. So all of these things combined make it very seductive for someone who wants to apply what he or she has learned in these technical uh, schools. Well, of course, it was tremendously exciting to be in Los Alamos. I mean, it was the, in my mind, the premier scientific uh, establishment in the world. When you study physics, uh, you uh, modern physics, you study uh, indirectly the history of the uh, uh, 20th century physics, which, is, which to a great extent is the history of, of the Manhattan Project. Mike Price worked as a systems developer at Los Alamos for five years from 1983. 
He was part of a team testing new components for hydrogen bombs. Jim Campbell works on the Star Wars program at the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. Before that, he was involved in assessing the effects of nuclear explosions for the Air Force. Ted Taylor became one of America's leading designers of nuclear weapons. At university, with his future wife, he'd actively campaigned against atomic weapons, but it was his old college professor who got him his first job at Los Alamos. We'd pile up a debt, and I had no prospects for a job. Bob Serber, my boss on the Hill, uh, said, calm down, Ted, I'll get you a job at Los Alamos. And I knew what Los Alamos was, was up to. Uh, unlike now, almost everything they did was on nuclear weapons. But I was uh, somehow vaguely thought I could be doing something that might not be on the bomb. But I didn't ask. So in November of 1949, uh, Carol and I and uh, Clara, who was less than six months old, arrived at Los Alamos. It was a shock when he first came home and told me. But the fact that he was so good at it was a bomb to wounded pride, and the fact that he now could support his family was uh, something that was very important, of course. We, we essentially had no choice but to, or thought we had no choice but to take that mm -hmm. particular job. I was excited. I mean, this was my first job, you know, uh, making my own way and moving away from home and all those good things. I remember my stepfather telling me as I was leaving uh, on the train, um, strangely enough, not on an airplane, but uh, on, on the train, he said to me, uh, well, it's a dirty job, but someone has to do it. And I never really understood what that meant until later on, because he'd been through World War II. And I think he thought that defense work was dirty, uh, but that someone had to do it. But I've always remembered that, that statement. I had three straight small children and uh, family to support. And, and uh, there was no competition to the city on the hill that pumped more money into the economy than any, any, other, any other thing in the whole area. So I was compelled to consider the possibility of working there for that reason alone. But there was also a, a fascination with it. I mean, this was, this was uh, uh, the mecca of physics in a way. It was, it, was a, uh, it was a very compelling, powerful thing. You know, there's, there's a beauty in technology. There's a beauty in knowledge and science. I don't think I can get this across to people how intense the pleasure is. I've never tried cocaine, but when people describe to me what it's like, maybe it's somewhat similar, maybe it isn't. All I know is when you've gone through this whole series of exciting steps and the moment of truth comes and you're standing there with dark glasses on, staring at the top of the tower 15 miles away and is it going to work is it going to work is it going to work Pow! it did it was just awesome the amount of power the the devastation the uh, the quantity of the just the enormity destructive power of those things uh, was just it was it was on a scale that was that went beyond our, our, our ability to think about it rationally so it was very exciting it, it swept you up it was uh, it was tremendously professionally enticing to be there uh, to have those kind of resources to put on a problem you felt like for the first time in your life you could do something right whatever resources it took whatever time it took and I loved it. I loved it. Every bit of it. I, I never have enjoyed such professional respect, uh, trust. Uh, it, was, it was tremendous. And if they made washing machines, 
I'd still be there. As Mike Price, Ted Taylor, and Jim Campbell continued to pursue their careers in the nuclear weapons industry, each of them began to have serious doubts about their work. I had a gradual sense of unease, just being vaguely more and more uncomfortable with what I was doing. Uh, and it, it exhibited itself in when I would sit in large meetings. Um, I simply had this uh, feeling, this real heavy feeling, and I took that initially to mean to me that I had a, a conscience problem. I had a, you know, a problem with, uh, with my conscience about what I was doing. I see it somewhat differently now. Um, I, I see it as simply a sense of sadness. The publication of this pamphlet about nuclear war by the Catholic Church in the United States added to Jim Campbell's uncertainties about his work. I think it was in 1983 that the bishops issued their letter of uh, the challenge of peace, which simply tried to set straight what the Catholic Church believes in the, uh, about de nuclear deterrence. And I thought it was really a good letter from many points of view. It had weaknesses, but after all, you know, it, it simply couldn't come out and say disarm. But it certainly gave me a hook, and it truly uh, I became active in the diocese in helping to promulgate the letter uh, by giving talks um, on behalf of the diocese uh, at various parishes to try to explain it. Sean Michael, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. God bless. In order for deterrence to work, our threats must be real to the other side. Uh, if they're not real, then deterrence isn't going to work because nobody's going to believe it. So that really came home to me um, right around the time that the bishop's letter came out because I realized that we have already pushed the button in a sense. We have already decided to kill millions of people in order to preserve a way of life that, that we seem to like. Um, and that disturbs me. That's a, that's a problem for me. Lawrence Livermore Lab is a sprawling 640 acres with entrances on all sides. Insert out. At dawn, thousands of demonstrators right, streamed onto the streets surrounding one. the lab and convoys of police from dozens of Northern California jurisdictions ready for action. Okay. A few years ago, Lawrence Livermore Lab was the scene of a large and uh, fairly raucous uh, demonstrations. Uh, many of the protests were uh, quite rude in, in, in the way they named and judged uh, those of us who work inside. The demonstrators said their goal was to focus public attention on stopping the nuclear arms race, and especially on stopping the lab's role in that weapons buildup. After one of the demonstrations, and everyone went away, one person stood alongside the road. Uh, and I don't know the man who is dressed in a, I, I can remember some kind of a dark jacket, almost like a pea jacket, a navy pea jacket with a, with a hat on. And for what seemed to me to be weeks, he stood by the side of the road and, and gave the peace sign to all of the people going into the laboratory, had a gentle smile on his face. And that really impressed me uh, more than all of the all of the demonstrations. Although I, I, I really welcome the demonstrators, but that person's commitment meant more to me than hearing what he had to say, um, seeing a slogan that he popped up, perhaps. But his dedication, his commitment, day after day, to stand there, to basically invite me to consider something different was just wonderful for me. So that's, you know, one person affected maybe several more at the lab, and those of us could, you know, will we'll gradually multiply. Jim Campbell is still at the Lawrence Livermore Laboratories. His doubts are not resolved, 
and he's continuing to raise questions at work about the morality of what he and his colleagues are doing. Mike Price has never shared his worries about nuclear weapons with any of his friends at Los Alamos. His has been a deeply personal battle with his growing doubts. It started out, to a great extent, uh, a, uh, a sense of discomfort. It was as if the, the effort of constantly putting out the implications and the full meaning out of my mind while I worked on something, uh, it, like it took a toll. It wore me out in some way. And at some point, it was like it was ri water rising behind a dam. And it became profoundly uncomfortable, as if it would break. And I often had the feeling I would, sometimes I would say to myself, my God, you better be careful, because this is no place to screw up. There were good reasons to maintain these weapons, I felt. But the amount of destruction, it was just the unleashing that power was such a crude, violent act. It was so mad. It was just, it was, there was nothing commensurate. There was no enemy evil enough to use those things against. And, and I think that a lot of it had to do with, with being a father and the importance that, that meant to me. I had small children. And if there's, a, if there's a grammar to conscience, our children know it. And maybe we've forgotten it. But I just never felt that I could explain it to my children. That it would be clear to them. You know, the, the idea of, of uh, you know, I just, I just felt that it would be more, that, you know, you, you try to bring your children up to have integrity and uh, to, to be able to stand up for the truth. And I couldn't, I could have not have faced them having made that kind of compromise. It was only 18 months ago that Mike Price finally resigned from Los Alamos. He wrote to a friend about why he decided to leave. Through my work, the weapons became more than an abstraction or a rumor. I saw how it all worked. Eventually, something inside me overcame my rationale, like an alarm inside getting louder and louder, warning me that I was losing something I didn't even know I had. It was such a personal conviction, not a matter of reason, that I couldn't discuss it with my coworkers. It wasn't a matter of argument or judgment. My feeling was this. They spend a million dollars a day on this stuff. They can afford anyone they want. They don't need me. I need to be doing something else. It took Ted Taylor more than 20 years to overcome his fascination with nuclear weapons. He had been under increasing pressure from his family about his job. I knew directly because of her talking about it that my mother didn't like what I was doing. And uh, Carol, I think, pretty well made that clear, at least I thought. It never seemed that you could make the world more peaceful by, by making it more warlike. But we really didn't talk about it. It was what he was doing with great enthusiasm and doing very well. And it didn't seem to be my place as wife at that time in that era to dispute it. And when we were in Berkeley, he and I agreed completely on atomic weapons and how you should never use them, have them, work on them. And it took him quite a while to come up with a perhaps almost as convincing argument in the other direction in Los Alamos that worked for him. I just couldn't let go for any reason to this situation where all this excitement was going on all the time. So I had to make up some answer to Carol and my mother. And what I came up with was we at Los Alamos and, and our counterparts at the, in the Soviet Union 
were the peacemakers of the world. Why? We were making war impossible. We were making it so horrible that it wouldn't happen. But in 1950, the Korean War broke out as Chinese troops battled with British and American forces. This was the closest that the United States had come to using nuclear weapons again since the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. When the Korean War got going full blast, without stopping and saying uh, I was wrong, without thinking about that at all, I started drawing circles again, but not on Moscow. These were on, among other things, the Iron Triangle, as it was called, a concentration of 500,000 Chinese troops in North Korea with a tactical A-bomb. And here it worked. I drew the circles, and everybody in that triangle would be killed. What's this about stopping war? Atomic bombs were finally not used in Korea. It was decided that the weapons then available were too indiscriminate. But Taylor had already anticipated these objections and began developing much smaller nuclear devices. These were the forerunners of the battlefield nuclear artillery that was eventually to be tested in the Nevada desert. So I was slipping into a situation in which not only was there a, a war going on, but I was pushing for or at least designing and building weapons that might be used in that war. From Los Alamos, Ted Taylor moved to the Pentagon as deputy director of the Defense Nuclear Agency. Among his new responsibilities was to keep track of every nuclear weapon in America's stockpile. I became aware of uh, how many nuclear weapons we had, where, 7,000 in Western Europe alone. We were scattering them all over the place, Turkey, on and on. And I had a sense of being rather suddenly uh, faced with the wrongness of what I had done before. All the arguments just disappeared one after another. Taylor left the Pentagon in 1966, but remains an active scientist. He served on President Carter's Commission of Inquiry after the accident at the Three Mile Island nuclear power plant and he's now involved in finding scientific solutions to some of the problems of developing countries. He's leading a team working on solar power as a cheap source of energy. And he's often asked to lecture about why his views on nuclear weapons have changed so dramatically. I gave a talk on my changes of heart, a meeting of Ground Zero and public. And uh, there was a lot of support of what I had been said. People got up and applauded and so on. And then a uh, man got up and back and said, we're letting this guy off too easily. Uh, what he did was unspeakably awful. Nothing he says or does is going to change that. It's done. And uh, that really shook me up. I started to tell Carol about this and started sobbing. But part of the sobbing was really regret at ever having done those things and sitting there gleefully drawing circles, bigger and bigger circles over bigger and bigger cities because I was excited and I would get disappointed when they were not as big as I thought they were or the city was bigger than I thought it was. That was infinitely sad. So that was part of, part of this outburst. Now, that's only happened once that I can remember. That clear a sign of uh, 
both uncertainty about what, what I was really doing now, my motives, and absolute revulsion that I, 40 years earlier, was uh, playing games with nuclear weapons. I, uh, I couldn't take that. After he left the atomic weapons industry, Ted Taylor joined the Pugwash Movement, an international organization of scientists campaigning to end the threat of nuclear war. Its meetings took him frequently to the Soviet Union and to detailed discussions with colleagues about disarmament. How to build a situation where conflicts are resolved peacefully by understanding each other. The the whole idea that then, having identified these things to do, some of which The Pugwash movement had begun 30 years earlier, taking its name from the small Canadian town where nuclear scientists from all over the world had first met. They'd been inspired by Albert Einstein and Bertrand Russell's declaration against atomic weapons. The big opportunity that I see is in the uh, popular pressure to get rid of weapons of mass destruction of all kinds as soon as possible. There is a tension being given that nuclear war means the end of everything. That ultimate danger has opened up, I think, the ultimate opportunity to get rid of violence as a characteristic of human behavior. In a break from meetings, Taylor was able to spend time with the founder of the Pugwash movement, Professor Joseph Rotblatt. In my case, um, I started life as a pure um, scientist, believing in pure research without any application. And all of a sudden, I find myself working on a, on a weapon of mass destruction. It completely go against the, my upbringing that a scientist should never do this sort of thing. There are reasons why, I wouldn't go into it now, I had to do it. And because of this, I completely changed the, the whole direction of my research. It was the invasion by Nazi Germany of his native Poland which led Rotblatt to overcome his doubts about working on an atom bomb. At the time, he was living in England and had joined the physics department at Liverpool University. I went to James Chadwick, who's the head of our department. I suggested to him that we should 
look at this problem, not from the point of view that we should produce a weapon to be used against other people, but rather to, to use it as a sort of deterrent. President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Churchill decided to consolidate their research efforts in the United States under the U.S. Army Corps of... As part of this Anglo-American agreement, Rotblatt was sent to Los Alamos to work on the bomb. But his doubts soon began to surface once again, and he was the first scientist to leave the Manhattan Project. Well, I could see immediately even the fallacy in relation to my own thing for justification for, for the working on the bomb, because suppose that Hitler had the bomb, and we too had it. Therefore, I, should, I, I believe that the last act of a madman like Hitler would be to send the bomb and destroy London, even if this had meant the destruction of Germany. He, in fact, he would see it a very well going down himself in this uh, Berlin bunker. In other words, you cannot really argue with, with people who are not rational. It may perhaps work with rational people. How can you guarantee that all the time, forever, we shall have uh, leaders who are really rational? Today, despite the dramatic improvement in relations between the Soviet Union and NATO, nuclear deterrence remains at the heart of strategic thinking on both sides. The attraction of nuclear weapons for the military planners is that they make war unwinnable and therefore less likely. But critics warn that nuclear weapons do not make war impossible. And they believe that you cannot properly defend a country with these weapons because if they were ever used, they could provoke its total destruction. Among the critics of deterrence are several retired nuclear planners from both NATO and the Soviet Union. One of them is Air Commodore Alistair Mackey, who commanded an RAF squadron of Vulcan hydrogen bombers in the 1950s. When he was promoted, he began to have serious misgivings about nuclear weapons. After the war, I found myself teaching strategy at the Joint Services Staff College, and particularly nuclear strategy, and I read up the classical strategists of whom I knew nothing, and I thought about what it was I was supposed to teach, and I found I could make no sense of it. It seemed to me that we were protecting ourselves against a threat that didn't exist. Then I was seconded to the cabinet office, and what I saw there of uh, Soviet intentions and Soviet affairs led me to refuse to believe that there was any possibility of a Soviet military threat against the United Kingdom. I ended my service career on the personal staff of the chief of air staff, giving him advice on this and that, including nuclear affairs, and what I did and read and saw at that time reinforced my conviction. Now let's look at the 25,000 strategic missiles that I spoke about. They come in two main categories. Land-based, of which... The Alistair Mackey left the Air Force determined to campaign against nuclear weapons. Otherwise known, His opposition to deterrence has in recent years brought him into contact with retired military colleagues in Europe who share his views. They have formed an organization which has won recognition from the United Nations for its work on disarmament. I was lucky enough to be invited to join the NATO group, Generals for Peace and Disarmament, and with them it's been my privilege to talk to other generals, particularly from the Soviet Union and uh, the socialist countries in East Europe, also with Americans, and to establish a remarkable community of view amongst a group of senior people who have done formal disciplinary training and strategy and who can see no more sense in the world nuclear strategy than I, in particular, can see in the United Kingdom nuclear strategy. The Soviet Union, under President Gorbachev, has become increasingly open to new strategic thinking, which relies less on nuclear weaponry. Retired General Boris Surikov is part of a research institute developing these ideas. 
But even as a serving soldier working on nuclear weapons, he privately had growing reservations. Я и раньше, раньше я считал, что ядерное оружие – это благо, и что для обороны страны его надо иметь. Потом, когда по характеру работы пришлось познакомиться с его боевыми возможностями, стал задумываться, надо ли гнаться, за мегатоножом, бомб, за их количеством и так далее. Сыриков remembers well the time his thinking changed. He'd returned home after speaking at an arms control conference in Switzerland. Мое выступление в Женеве касалось новых видов вооружений, которых сегодня нет, но которые могут появиться через 5, 10, 15 лет. И дочь моя плакала от этого выступ... от моего выступления, которое она прочла, когда я вернулся из командировки в Женеву. Дочь моя, она уже взрослая женщина, она грамотный инженер, хорошо разбирается во всяких то... серьезных вещах. И, естественно, на нее вот все эти вещи, они новые были, вот о них нигде никто не писал, поэтому и у нее родилась тогда первая Наша внучка, моя внучка первая, Оксанка. Вот это все, конечно, на нее произвело впечатление. Она плакала. Вот. А, а, а ее слезы, они еще раз заставили меня задуматься, а нет ли других путей, нет ли других способов избавления человечества от этих бед. Так я постепенно стал не воинственным генералом, а генералом-патриотом, который любит свою родину. Все я готов сделать для ее защиты, для получения народа. Но я не хочу никакого вреда ни американскому народу, ни любим другим народам на земле. Сыриков is now in regular contact with his counterparts in the United States, where one of the most outspoken critics of nuclear strategy is Admiral Eugene Carroll. Until his retirement, he was deputy head of naval planning at the Pentagon. My personal feelings about nuclear warfare really started forming when I became aware of nuclear weapons in 1955. I started flying airplanes designed to deliver nuclear weapons, and I started training with the weapons, handling them, uh, arming my plane with them, ready to go to war. Uh, and, and from that experience, I learned that you can't fight with them. And then the monstrous nature of the attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki became much clearer to me. Uh, there was not truly warfare involved. It was political action with uncontrollable power, with force. And, and uh, that's the problem today. We can't fight with these weapons for any objective or logical purpose. And I wrote a formal thesis on this point in 1958, arguing for the Navy to get rid of all of its nuclear weapons. Well, that was all right for a student to do that at the Naval War College. But when I got to be an admiral and was appointed to a position as the number two man in Navy plans and policy, and I talked about alternatives to nuclear warfare and talked about a different kind of a Navy, I was very quickly the odd man out. Admiral Carroll today works at the Center for Defense Information, which has invited retired Soviet officers to Washington. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? The ceremony you are about to witness is an army replay ceremony to be conducted for the delegation of Soviet retired generals. All military personnel in uniform should render the hands... Моё краткое пребывание в Америке произвело на меня очень большое впечатление. Здесь живут очень простые, добрые люди, и я думаю, что мы должны найти взаимное понимание и сделать мир более спокойным и прекрасным. А наши усилия сосредоточить и на создании новых систем и видов оружия массового уничтожения, а на решении многих других проблем, которые перед международным общественным жизнь поставила. Это и экологические проблемы, и борьба с раковыми заболеваниями, и спид, и голод, и детская смертность, и бедность в развивающих странах. Вот куда наши совместные усилия должны быть сосредоточены. Я так, как солдат, считаю.
что советский народ в прошлой мировой войне, в Великой Отечественной войне, потерял 20 миллионов человек. Он войны не хочет и никогда не будет с Америкой воевать. Мы надеемся, что американский народ этого не хочет. Before he retired from the army, Boris Surikov had to live constantly with the conflict between his high rank and his horror of nuclear war. It's a problem Eugene Carroll knew well. I was told to plan the destruction of a particular target in time of war, and I actually stood watch on the flight deck of a carrier on an airplane armed with that weapon to go destroy a target, to destroy one military target of not great significance. I was going to have to kill 600,000 people. Now, how do you live with yourself? How do you live with the idea of fighting a nuclear war when you realize you would be the instrument of the destruction of hundreds of thousands of people for for almost no reason whatsoever. I, I think the discussion which we have heard here, even among the members of the <coughs> Soviet delegation... Over the past four years, Eugene Carroll has been involved in a whole series of meetings between retired American and Soviet officers. Uh, the Soviet Union, for all of its great glories, has not repealed human nature. And uh, so as long as there is a democratic process, there will be differing opinions, and, and we are privileged to... When meetings like this first began, the non-nuclear defense plans they'd been developing seemed far-fetched. But today, as military strategists look to a future beyond the Cold War, the ideas are being taken more seriously. You have some time... The strategy they're discussing is called mutual security. In order to be secure, a nation must have a strong economy. It must have a very strong political social system in which people live together. And it must have strong diplomacy. It must maintain a strong network of friends and allies around the world. When all of those factors come together, then you really have security. But if you just waste all your money in building more weapons, you actually become less secure. The idea of mutual security is just exactly the opposite. Let's become safe by making our adversaries safe. Let's reduce their risk. Let's have them, in a negotiated agreement, reduce our risk. We'll have fewer weapons, we'll have less dangerous weapons, we'll live together with more confidence that neither side is preparing or even capable of attacking the other. And that's the idea of mutual security. But NATO and Warsaw Pact defense planners have for many years relied on their ability to heighten fear and insecurity on the other side in order to protect their own countries. In Europe, both sides still have plans for deep strikes into each other's territories using massive tank and mobile artillery forces backed up by the threat of limited nuclear war. And although these are put forward as part of an overall defensive strategy, to the other side, they always look offensive and threatening. Mutual security emphasizes instead non-offensive defense and the need to build confidence between opposing forces. It requires that both sides get rid of weapons which could be used to mount a surprise attack. And its advocates stress the urgency of effective verification of arms control agreements. Надо снизить военное противостояние Европе и перейти на доктрину достаточной обороны. Суть ее заключается в том, что нужно иметь в первую очередь оборонительное оружие. Зенитные управляемые ракеты против самолетов, противотанковые ракеты, танки, атомные пушки убрать, ликвидировать стратегические ракеты, оперативно-тактические. Их слишком много. We know perfectly well now how to defend ourselves without being offensive. The reason for that is the emerging technologies of weaponry. There are weaponries and ranges of weapons now which are demonstrably defensive. If you leave me alone, buddy, you are as safe as you can be. But if you attack me, you will get some very nasty surprises indeed. There are weapons that can wipe 
tanks off the face of the earth. There are weapons that can blot out communications. And you can't attack without communications, but you can defend. In Switzerland, non-offensive strategies have long been at the center of military planning. The army relies on strong but conventional anti-aircraft defenses to back up the air force. And to protect against any invasion led by tanks, throughout the country there's a network of heavily fortified infantry positions. Quiet. The Swiss are confident that with this kind of defense, its army could not be overrun by an aggressor. Non-offensive defense is a good idea. It's, it's a very complicated one and hard to work out in detail because no weapon really is purely offensive or defensive. A tank can be used either way. An airplane can be used either way. But if you say to your adversary, let's reduce our offensive capabilities. You cut back on your tanks in Europe. We'll cut back on some of our aircraft. Here's mutual security, and here's non-offensive defense. We each cut down the ability to attack the other. Therefore, we're both safer. I think that mutual security and pure defense are very, very important principles that need to be discussed at the bargaining table and worked out in detail over the coming years. Good night. Good night. Good morning. How are you? Nice to see you. As Presidents Bush and Gorbachev met in Malta at the end of last year, it was clear that progress was being made. After earlier agreement to reduce short-range nuclear weapons, they agreed to accelerate negotiations on the so-called START Treaty, which would cut strategic warheads by between 30 and 50 percent. But the concept of mutual security itself has yet to win a wide acceptance in the United States, although it has been endorsed by President Gorbachev. After several decades of us scientists in Pagwash preaching the need for a new way of thinking on these issues, that for the first time, at least the leader of one nation has really started this new way of thinking. I'm referring to uh, Mikhail Gorbachev with his ideas, which really a new approach to problems of security, as he said himself, not much good if I try to be more secure for myself, if by doing this I make the, my opponent less secure, because it's no good, no good for either of us. Therefore, we must talk about common security. перестройка, которая предлагает Советский Союз, те доктрины оборонительные, они как раз и направлены на решение этих проблем. Мы предложили, Америка согласилась, начать сократить на 50% стратегический, стратегический боеголовок ну, и ракет авиационного базирования. Это прекрасно, но это мало. Надо думать еще большим, потому что, чтобы уничтожить... Америку или уничтожить Советский Союз, достаточно 300 ракет, достаточно 300 зарядов. Зачем нам столько нужно? The START Treaty as now proposed uh, is really not that significant. It will reduce a lot of nuclear weapons, but for example, it'll only bring us back to about the 1981 level. We will have rolled back eight years of nuclear buildup. Now that's good. I don't mean to say we shouldn't. What I'm saying is it, it is not really a great improvement. We will each retain the ability to destroy the other one dozens of times. And what we need to do is to be looking at this idea of mutual security, reducing the ability to attack the other side in significant ways so that we reach the point where neither side need fear an attack by the other. The Victory Day Parade in Red Square. 
For the past two years, it's been scaled down to match the improving relations with NATO. But in the Soviet Union, there are conservative forces within the military who oppose rapid disarmament. And in the West, both President Bush and Margaret Thatcher have recently spoken out strongly for nuclear weapons. There are huge mountains of opposition to overcome, mountains of vested interest, what Eisenhower called the politico-military industrial groups whose interests ride on nuclear weapons. There is a colossal ignorance, which I have to say is deliberately fostered by the media, both in the West and to a degree in the East, and those are formidable difficulties. But much greater difficulties than that have been overcome by people who were dealing with huge problems. We must find a new way. And I'm optimistic that we can because the human race has solved a lot of tough problems in the past. 125 years ago, human beings thought that slavery was an absolutely natural and moral part of human existence. Some people were born to be masters, others were born to be slaves. And, and that system had tremendous economic pressure to maintain it. The wealthy people were the masters and the poor people were the slaves. And yet, in 125 years, that pernicious notion is gone from the earth. The human race has abandoned it. No one argues that slavery is moral or ethical or even essential to, to a good economy. So if we can solve the problem of slavery, I'm positive we can find a way to solve this tyranny of weapons. Although primarily concerned with the nuclear debate and nuclear disarmament... Many of the scientists and generals who have left the nuclear weapons industry feel that at last the tide is turning. And as the Pugwash movement met in London, there was a renewed sense of purpose. It was the occasion of the 80th birthday of its founder, Joseph Rotblat. Life has developed on this planet in a marvelous way. And there are so many exciting things going on on this world that we should try to, to foster its continuation, its development all the time. Uh, you know, I'm an optimist in the sense, you know, the, the, the saying by Cabell, the, 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 uh, the, the optimist proclaims that this is the best of all possible worlds in which uh, you can live and the pessimist fears that this is true. Well, I do not accept this dictum. I do not think that this is the best of all possible worlds. But nevertheless, it's precious enough for us to do our utmost to preserve it and then to work towards improvement.